Today, we are fishing with Alex Pollitt and the crew of Noosa Blue Water Charters. The plan is to use soft plastic techniques to target some of the many species we are likely to find in the deep water off this lovely part of our coastline. A good depth sounder or fish finder is a valuable tool for locating either the type of structure to be targeted or concentrations of fish. Winter time off Noosa often means locating gravel bottom structure in combination with some reasonable shows of bait fish. Today we're targeting this type of structure in 45 plus metres of water hoping to find good concentrations of fish. What I find is I, I, try, I get about three quarters of the way down and then and typically I've been feeding the line out through my hands bill and then as I get to about that position I'll start shaking, pausing, and then basically letting it sink again. And where you get particularly the snapper schooling, they'll often be five to 10 meters off bottom. And often that twitch and pause, and then off on the flutter, it's a pretty impressive bite. It'll absolutely rip line out of your hands, and it's a case of engaged strike, and away you go. That's amazing. So it's, um, some days, look, they'll just eat it on the drop, but other days when they're a bit touchy, that shake and pause, exactly what you need to get them going. I'd have to call it finesse fishing on the reef. Hey, look, as I've never fished half ounce soft plastics in 50 metres on the reef before. W without a doubt, yeah. it is, and, and it's um, all, all the oh, this little bite, all the technique that you're using in six to eight metres of water, you're still using out here, but it's just you, you're adapting your weight and some of your approach. Oh. See, I, that was going, I, that should have been sinking, and yeah. nothing happened, and I thought, yeah. oh, hang on a sec, something's grabbed a hold of this, so the benefit of having coloured braided lines, so you, it's very visual, you're actually watching the whole time, you know, that where that where that line meets the water is telling you a lot of stuff. You're a fly fisherman from the stream, so they'll indicate a nymphing approach. It's very similar. You're, yeah. you're seeing a lot of bites in your line sometimes before you've detected them. So I picked that up just by the fact that where it should have been sinking, it suddenly wasn't. And that was, by the look of it, about 10 metres off the bottom, so yeah. something's suspending up there and has eaten it on the way through. Certainly when they're, when they're not uh, fighting hard, it's a good way to fish for it. You've got to finesse. Yes. And it's not even that, it's, it's like quite often I'll be sitting in a, in a boat with a few other anglers and we're all fishing plastics, but one, one, of, one of the anglers is catching the better fish and you're thinking, oh, what's he doing differently? And then you go and have a look and they, they're fishing a, a jig head that's about half as light as everyone else. So they're taking longer to get to the bottom, but that very subtle presentation is what's fooling the better fish. So we're all catching legals, but someone's getting the four, five, six kilo snapper and that's the, where the finesse side comes in. And it's all about just being switched on to how can I better present this plastic to fool those cautious fish. What's the average size of snapper you get on these Queensland reefs? Look, um, a, an average fish for us probably is around that two to three kilo size. Yep. You know, little squarries, they, they might, they're just starting to form the bump. Yep. But, uh, it, there's a bit of conjecture about what's the better season for the big fish. Now, I'm a big fan of from about November through to April out here. I find summertime you get a lot of your, your, your big bumpy headed guys coming into the shallow reefs and eating your crab and, and all, all the food items which sit in that shallow reef. So um, that's when you start getting your better runner fish, which is your, your four. Oh, the way? No? So for us, a, better, a, a good fish would be that four to eight kilo mark, and then we do get some of the XOSs around here which bump up to that 11, 12 kilo size, good but fish. average size for us is around that three kilo squirry size, and typically there's plenty of them. And your classic season is over the winter, months in June, it's, July, August? And, and it's my opinion, uh, my opinion only, but you'll, in winter time, they'll basically start from around May, they'll start doing a little bit of the spawning thing, and what that means is that First you'll get all those males, those two to three kilo males starting to form big schools. And what they'll do is cruise out to the gravel beds. And it, it's, it's a bit like trout spawning, Bill. They've got to find that ground which is right for them. And they'll all sit on these gravels and, uh, and some of the bigger females will then cruise in and do the whole spawning thing. Now, when you can find those gravel beds and those congregations of fish, you're usually in for some pretty good fishing. But it's all about uh, part A of the fishing equation, Bill, is to find the fish first. And I think that's going to be our test today. They're, uh, they've been a little bit tough the last few weeks. But I think if we can find those concentrations, we're going to start finding some fish. Now we're getting the small squire. Be some big ones somewhere. I think I've got you, Bill. Yep. Baby squire. I find a lot of discussion about 
colours of lures and plastics around the place. And uh, it's no different with this soft plastics market. There's a whole range of colours and all the different types of plastics which you can get on the market. And uh, look, they do seem to make some difference as to your catch rates. And I think primarily one of the, one of the key reasons is that these days we actually get some that glow. And it uh, doesn't always stand doesn't always stand out clearly when you're fishing in the daytime because we don't actually see a glow but we're fishing in 50 metres of water now so down below 20 metres it's actually getting pretty dark so that's where you can sometimes get the benefit of actually using a plastic which glows uh, in the dark. Um, to not fool yourself with the whole colour spectrum because um, it is very easy to get to get confused with colours when you go into your tackle store and there's about 40 different colours of plastics to use. I try to simplify the equation. I like to have a really nice funky colour like this nuclear chicken. It's a bit like you, Bill. It's a bit funky, glows in the dark. But I'll have a nice bright colour like that and then I'll have a nice natural colour like a, 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 a natural green or a brown. And by having those two colour choices, I haven't confused myself and I'll basically cover the spectrum of bright versus natural colours. and. On different days, one will outperform the other, but I'm not going to go and trial 10 different colours. I've got my bright one on my natural one, so it's a bit of a tip when it comes down to colour selection. The bright and glow-in-the-dark nuclear chicken and uh, New Penny, a very opaquey pumpkin seed brown colour. Ah, oh, shark. Little shark. They all like the plastics. <sighs> Been a few of these around lately. I love a plastic as well. I'll just uh, get him in the boat because he'll go a bit silly yeah, when I do it, Bill. Him. Thanks, Chucky. Little black tip reef shark. Like a nice little, like the little Berkeley gulp six inch grub. Yep. <laughs> just ripping a little soft plastic up from the bottom in 50 metres of water to check it out, and it's been intercepted on the way out. I'm getting a little bit puffed. It's using a fairly light outfit here. It's about a seven foot Berkeley Diablo uh, spin outfit. It's rated about six to 10 kilos, 20 pound braid. It's all uh, nice light gear. It really allows you to enjoy the, the actual sport of catching these guys. Adds a whole lot of entertainment to it. Running a bit like a tuna. Good sport though. Wish a bit of deep water. Get a bit puffed by the time they get up. Bit of a lucky draw this time of year. So many pelagics coming through. You never know if it's a cobia or a mackerel or a tuna. This makes it uh, part of that lucky draw factor. I think keeps it really entertaining. Sometimes like this, when, when you're using the light spin rods, it's always nice to have a bit of butt length. It'll make it a lot easier on yourself by having that extended butt you can just tuck under the armpit. Make life a bit easier on you. Your life left in. A lot of people panic when they're catching fish on lighter lines and light gear like this. A lot of it's just about rod angles. You can really quickly tie a fast, quite large fish by just simply using a lot of rod angles. I notice a lot of fly anglers are really good at it, especially the saltwater fly guys. That, when they get fish that are taking long runs on light gear, they really use those rod angles 90 degrees to the fish to start to continue to keep turning that head. And just the, the agitation of continually changing direction actually works to tire a fish out. And it's very impressive what you can tame on fairly light gear these days particularly with the design and the quality of equipment that we're getting coming into our country these days. I was in these waters about six months ago. I managed to, to uh, land about a 60 kilo sail on pretty much exactly the same outfit. It took about an hour and a quarter, but I managed it. And so it's a real lesson as to what you can do on this light spin gear. And you can enjoy the battle from basically hook up to the boat. Sneak 2 coming out on a charter that enjoys using a range of techniques. I'm fishing today with Alex and the guys from Noosa Blue Water Charters based out of Noosa. And they really add a lot of entertainment to their trips because they don't just do the, the, the stock standard bottom bashing approach which you see in a lot of charters these days. They'll use the soft plastics, they'll use a the range of hard body lures and just means the punters are in for a great entertaining day where they can tangle with pretty much anything from marlin to snapper. 
If you're up this way, it's definitely worth coming and checking them out. You're going to enjoy the day. Tuna have got that very distinctive tail beat action. A lot of fish lost at the bait, especially when they've tugged away for a little while. Anglers get a little bit tired, like I'm getting now, and you sort of you want to see what it is and get it in the boat. And uh, sometimes just that little bit of impatience and going a bit harder towards the end of a fight sees a few fish either break lines or spit hooks. So it's worth just maintaining the patience all the way to the boat to just wear them down, keep wearing them down, and get them close enough to uh, to get them in the boat. Tailing Alex. Oh, there you go. They're fairly chunky mac tuna. They go hard all the way to the boat. He's eating that soft plastic on the way up to the boat. They're great sport fish. They're not much, not much chop on the table. We'll get this, get this guy back into the water fairly quickly to let him keep going. But a whole lot of fun on light gear. Fishing light line on the reef sometimes. It's coming now. It can be a good tip to for fishers charging no, for reef to actually just back right off of them. Sometimes the harder you go on some of these fish and the more you get them to panic, the harder they're going to go for the reef. So a good tip when you're using the really light stuff is to, if you're doing your mental arithmetic and thinking he's getting pretty close to reef, back right off. So you just maintain contact with the fish and you'll sometimes find that uh, they stop panicking and they basically come up in the water column and you can tame those fish. So it's almost, you're almost fooling them to some degree. But you've got to be good at knowing where you are in the water column. And Bill's using a fair bit of that skill at the moment. I reckon you'll get this, Bill. Nice haven't... fish anyway. Yeah. Tell you what, we haven't... Yeah, just keep working just... this way. That's it. That's it. Just a little, real little short whips, and you'll actually find you, you might start turning that head up. That's it. Maybe, you know. Yeah. I wouldn't have picked it as a snapper. It's sort of. Hasn't, um, he hasn't head shaken yet much, has he? Well, it's like it nudged something else off on the bite. Knocked something out of the way that was having a. Oh, okay. um, and he's just swiped through it. Oh, yeah. yeah, that feels a bit more. <laughs> Good fun though, this light gear on the reef. It'll work you it's out. Very light. You know? <laughs> now, a lot of anglers look at this gear and they say that's way too light to be fishing on the reef stuff, but it's very impressive what you can actually catch on this stuff these days. In terms of entertainment, you're not lugging around big oh, absolutely. gear. You're, you're, it's a bit like fly fishing, you're enjoying yeah. the whole battle of the fish because you don't have that additional weight getting in the way of fighting these things. Old blokes like you might maybe tie you out a little bit on the way, but. Let's see how we go. <laughs> Actually, this diabaging rod, this doing a great job. It's 10 PE, which means it's a 10 kilo outfit. So very light in the tip, but gee, it locks like up down the bottom. Yeah. yeah. Tell you what, there's a bit of fish on this thing. There's, there's a good, bit good more fishing fish. here. I'm hoping it may be a code, but I haven't seen it. Yeah. It doesn't. It doesn't feel like a snapper. No, nah, it's not a snapper. I'm just nah, wondering could be if it's another one of those Mac tuners, yeah. I don't know if it's just... 
I'm getting a bit shy online here. Oh, yeah. right. What's the backing on it? Oh, it's mono. Ah, it's all right. Take time. Not much though, only about 20 metres, so... Only 20 metres? Yeah. So we're going to get serious now. No, 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 let him, let him, yeah, you'll get him back. Just use heaps of rod work on him. And try 90 degree him. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Try and get that head going that way. You might just keep fishing while you're doing this build. Might be a good idea. Time, get this. Might be another 10 minutes. One of the reasons I moved to Noosa is it's quite a unique place fishing-wise. It's basically that, that line where you get a lot of the northern and the southern species start to mix. So you have such a wealth of species at your back doorstep that uh, I think yeah, it'll take a lifetime to start getting through all those species. But I'm going to have fun trying. Oh, yeah, see how he is. Yeah, I might be able to tell him. I'd, say, him. I'd say on this tackle he's going to be a bit, a bit hard. Yeah. And you told me this is going to be fun. Lure fishing in South Queensland. Are you having fun, dude? Yeah, I am. It's great. It's just a matter of slowly leading them up, isn't it? Just use those little lines and you can sort of slowly get the head up. Because yeah. the trouble with them is as you drop your rod, they just take go back down to that. Yeah. Oh, here he goes. Got colour. Blue. Back. Back to no, he's a Mac. Oh, he's a Mac tuna. Well, there you go. There's a nice shot with that plastic there, too. That's a, what a great looking fish. Oh, well, it was about the same size as yours. That's all right. And the old. Uh, that just goes to show you, doesn't it, though? Even down deep, though, they're obviously down there. So, what's the, the soft plastic? So, I was going to get it out of his mouth. He wasn't coming off in a hurry. So, there we go. Got him on yeah. a little new penny six inch gulp grub. And they like them. They do. We might just see if we can let this guy yeah, go. Just give him a quick spear. Yeah, he's only bleeding from the mouth wound. Here yeah. we go. Good fish. Long time. Thanks. Nigel, picking the bottom up. 50, 50 metres of water is a long way down for a quarter ounce, half ounce jig. Yep. With a big, big hunk of plastic on it. So you can see here, it takes a while. Now, I'm on the. No. Yeah, without down, you've you can got just to... see here, you just wait. It's, it it's comes not going to plummet to the bottom. It comes down to um, the tackle that you're using as well, Bill. We're obviously using braid today, and that makes a massive difference when it comes to detecting either bites or when you're getting close to the bottom. Because consider, too, you're not just fishing 50 metres, you're fishing 50 metres with current flow. Sure. So you can potentially get a jig head that gets to bottom and then picks up and lifts again with current. Yep. So it's, all, it's about a key to knowing if you're on the bottom is really just about watching that braid. And when it starts doing something different, you're either yep. starting to detect a bite or you're starting to get to those. You can see it stall here, but then it picks <clears throat> up again. Yeah, so it's. And yeah, look, I reckon probably three minutes I've been dropping this. And letting it now. drift. And, and letting it drift, yeah. But it's just a matter of trying to pick up. First thing I need to know is when it's on the bottom. When you know it's on the bottom, you can then pick it up 20 you feet, can, you, you can, can pick it up 10 feet, and you just know what you're doing then. Exactly, you can then start hopping your yep. retrieve or, and stuff like that. I think, too, a lot of people get caught up in thinking that they have to get to bottom, Bill. Oh, no. It's, for me, it's all about letting that jigger go down as far until I start getting bites. Yep. Some days I'll never get to the bottom, and I'll have I'll have caught a nice bag of fish, and it's just because I just got to the fish. And that comes down to the whole presentation of soft plastics. That, the, slow, the more slowly you can get down to the fish, the better fish you're going to catch. Yeah. I think um, one, one issue we have sometimes with fishing with soft plastics is a bit of a, a remnant from the bottom bashing days. Yep. We want to get the heaviest jig we can possibly get, and basically yep. bombs away. Boof, this is down. on the bottom now. There you go, so you've you just got just the see, bottom you've now. You've just got a loop now. Now that's taken probably three minutes. And so we're fishing now in, yeah, in 50 odd metres of water, and I've gone down to a five eight ounce. We haven't yeah. got a lot of current today, and it's taking it's taking a good three to four minutes to get down there. But I'm starting to get better bites now that I've, yeah. I've gone that little There's bit lighter. There you go. Well, that's your classic imitation of a a dying bait fish, isn't it? That, that's exactly Spiraling right. Spiralling up and then just fluttering back down. And a lot of a lot of your bites will happen on the drop. A lot of people think, oh, it's going to happen when I've got my line tied and I can feel the fish bite it. Not the case. A lot of the bites happen as that as that plastic is slowly sinking through the water column because it is the imitation of the dying bait yeah. fish. Yeah. And I notice you do a lot of shaking of the rod. 
I do as I which start is whacking the plastic up and then just letting it drop down again. Exactly right. As I start getting close to, close to that strike zone, I start shaking that plastic, I'm trying to pause it in the water column before letting it go back down. So um, I've found the reason I start doing that is because some days I've had it odd bump and then nothing's become of it. And then after a bit of shaking and pausing, a really good fish has come and eaten it. So, yeah. so from my understanding, that fish has actually been sitting there looking at that for a few minutes and it wasn't until I shook it that he thought, oh, hang on, yeah, maybe that is worth eating. And he's come and finally taken the bait. So that's the reason I've, I've thrown that into the, the repertoire bill. I might talk a little bit about some of the hardware we use when we're fishing soft plastics. For those who are not familiar, this is what we call a jig head. So this is what we use to mount our plastics and it's the, the hook we use to ultimately hook our fish. They come equipped with obviously the lead which is used to weight this plastic to get it down to the depth that you want to get it to. And on top of that they come with a moulded lead keeper which works to, to, to keep that soft plastic on the hook and it means that fish can't easily pull it away. There's a right way and there's a couple of wrong ways to rig a plastic. At the end of the day, we don't want to have plastics rigged up like that, sideways on the hook. They're all designed to operate a certain way in the water and, and we want to rig them up to make, maximise the action that these are designed to produce. A good starting point is to lie the plastic alongside your hook so you can actually see whereabouts that hook point is meant to penetrate this plastic. There's a couple of other little tricks. One thing we don't want to do is basically bury this hook so far in that plastic that we don't have enough gape to properly hook a fish when they do take the plastic. So to start with, we want to penetrate the face of this plastic roughly down the centre line of the plastic but heading towards the upper section. We then want to thread the plastic onto the hook, breaching it in that point which we designated prior and then threading it out over that keeper. Now what that means, by running that hook reasonably close to the top of the plastic, I haven't totally sunk that hook into, the, into it. I've got a nice bit of gape to hook fish, and when you look at it, that plastic is sitting nice and aerodynamically. It's, it's, it's straight in pretty much all orientations. So when it's in the water, it's going to operate how this plastic's designed to. We've spoken a bit about the pointy end of proceedings, but we might talk now about the rest of the outfit which we use to maximi maximise our soft plastics fishing offshore. Now, you'll notice that I've got two different coloured lines here. I've, I've got a reel which is spooled with a braided line. Now we've got many models and types of braided line on our market and a lot of them are very good ones. Um, the benefit of using a braided line is you can use a fairly fine diameter line but it's all, and it has very little, or it's got minimal stretch in it. So what that means is that you're really easily able to detect bites when you're fishing down below. And you can also present the plastic very effectively in deep water situations. Attached to that so that the fish don't actually see what you're using, I then employ about a two metre litre of uh, your normal monofilament or fluorocarbon fishing line. Um, there's arguments about whether fluorocarbon or monofilaments is, you know, one's better than the other. I enjoy using my fluorocarbon lines. I think um, they seem to reduce reflection, but they've also got, they're fairly resistant to abrasion. So I, I stick to my fluorocarbon leaders for that reason. I typically measure out a, a good two metres, and that for me is a standard uh, leader which I attach to my braid. I use two very simple knots, and the beauty of when you're fishing with soft plastics is you don't have a lot of knots and attachments to your rig. I use a Centauri knot to attach my uh, leader to my hook, and at the braided line end, I use a, a Slim Beauty knot to attach that fluorocarbon leader to my braid. And you can actually, as you can see, it's, it's a very slim line knot. It's very strong, and uh, the, the, the fact that you can anchor off in a figure of eight knot the monofilament means that these knots really don't slip no matter how much you cast with them all day. So that's the, uh, the business end of the tackle. There's many, many light soft plastic blank rods on the market these days and there's many of them that are a pleasure to use. I'm a big fan of the seven foot Berkeley drop shot or Diablo rods, but that being said, my advice to people that are going looking for a rod is just to go into the shop and pick up stuff that feels right. I think when you, it's a bit like playing golf, you pick up a golf club that feels comfortable in your hand, you're gonna play well with it. Exactly the same deal when you're choosing fishing rods. If you pick up something that feels good in your hand, and it's going to be roughly the right weight to, to undertake the type of fishing you're going to, you're going to uh, typically be doing. You're probably going to catch more fish with it. The other side of the equation is using a fishing reel, which is going to maximise the components which you're using to fish soft plastics. These days, some of the things you want to look for in a reel that's, that you're using to fish your plastics is a nice broad spool that can fit enough line that you're going, to be, you're going to be needing to fish with. For example, we're fishing 50 metres of water here today, so I want to make sure I've got a good 150 to 200 metres of line on it. Uh, you definitely want to have a nice smooth drag system. There's nothing worse than hooking up a good fish and just because of a, a clunky drag you're losing it. 
and the other thing is you just want it to be relatively light and smooth to operate. Other than that, it's a very effective soft plastics rig. That's a lot better. Okay. Oh, that's all. Okay. Oh, no, we still got him. You want as well, Chuck? Yep. Although the fishing was largely shut down today, we were still able to fool a few fish using subtle deep water plastics techniques. Adopting a finesse approach to your deep water soft plastics applications will produce quality fish for you more often than not.